It's okay, right? It's already, yeah, looks pretty okay. Okay, um, hello everyone. Today I'll be talking about designing a 16-bit processor using Verilog in a Basis tree board, which is a Xilinx board. And so just some background. So I have recently been learning Verilog and VHDL because of the E2026 module in NUS. And during the module, they actually pass you a Basis 3 FPGA board, which is the Artix 7 architecture. And there's a whole bunch of logic cells, and it's actually pretty nice. And they actually teach you how to use the development environment, Vivado Design Suite, which is a bit old, but you know, whatever, it's, it's OK. And this is what the board looks like. So if this is not actually part of the module in any way. I just wanted to build a 16-bit processor because it's just like when you're building something, you get to really learn how it works. So it's really fun to um, go ahead and design your own processors. And also, I have a lot of time. So for specifications, um, I set for eight internal registers. Um, there are no special registers inside, so there's no like register that's always zero or something like that. It's a 16-bit instruction set architecture, so the instructions are 16-bit long. And I have implemented some fake RAM temporarily inside the FPGA, and um, it's 16-bit addressable to keep things simple for now. And oh, it's a very simple pipeline. Yeah, and I'll explain more the pipeline later on. So the very first part of, 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 the, comp of the, the processor would be a register file. And what's a register file? Well, it contains the 16-bit internal registers inside this block diagram. And basically, the, the basic ports, the inputs are on your left. The inputs are on your left, and the outputs are on your right. <laughs> so the inputs are the clock, the write enable, the enable, the overall enable, the selectors for A, B, and D, and the data input for D. So how this works is that selectors for A and B, they are um, three bytes long, and they select for between the eight internal registers, and those will appear on the outputs data A and data B, and those are 16 bits wide, the buses. And uh, the select D allows you to select a, a register for you to write to, and the data D usually comes from the ALU, so the output from the logic arithmetic logic unit will go into data D, and select D will decide which register that gets written into. And the write enable and re-enable is because of the pipeline later on, which uses enable assertion to make sure that all of the modules go enabled in a certain pattern, which I'll explain more later on. And the clock is because every CPU needs to be synchronously clocked. If not, everything will happen at once, and nothing will work. So this is the basic Verilog for, for something like that, and it's pretty simple. It's just um, it, it, the part on, on here. What it does is just assigns the selected register and, assign, and outputs it to data A or data B. That's, that's essentially it. OK, so for FPGAs, there's this special thing. Like, in, you know, if you have code, you usually just compile it every time. But for FPGAs, you don't generate stuff and test it on your board every single time. This is because I found that every time you generate a bit stream, it takes like a few minutes and it's really slow. And also because you want to make sure that your hardware works before you flash it onto your, your, your FPGA. So it's, there's a need for simulating at regular intervals. So each separate sub-module, you would simulate it separately and write specific test benches to bring it through all the steps and make sure that everything is working properly before you spend the time to go ahead and generate a bit stream. And um, a bit stream is basically the, the file that you, do, that you flash or sort of flash onto the FPGA to set its, its logic blocks. So for the, the register, what I'm doing is the test bench process is that you read register 0 and 1, uh, you write and, and you write FF, FF into R0, and then a bunch of stuff happens, and then you check on R4 at the end, and R4 should have 0x, 4, 4, 4, 4 after that. And this is the waveform that you get. And um, you see that there's 4, 4, 4, 4 there, so it, it works. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> uh, so the next part um, is actually the instruction set decoder. But before you decide on the instruction set decoder, you need to decide what the instruction set is. Because as I said, it's a custom instruction set. So I had to design my own instruction set architecture from scratch. So the features is meant to be bare minimum. The functions, uh, in a summary, I'm leaving out a few. It's just sign, add, subtract, the compares, the bitwise logical operations, which are also signed. I'm sorry, not signed, I mean. Yeah, and then the jumps, the loads for the immediate values, the fetch and write to memory. And um, yeah, that's about it. There are, about, there are exactly 14 opcodes for, for my case. And, uh, and the full instruction set feature is available on GitHub. You can go to the GitHub page, and you'll see a readme file, which has all the things very detailed. So uh, when you're designing an instruction set, um, I wanted to make sure that it's relatively easy to parse inside the FPGA, because I didn't want the slices of the instructions that go to the outputs to be dependent on the opcode. I, I didn't want to change that around 
um, on a conditional with the opcode, which means that so that there are no marks, there are no multiplexes there. And uh, you realize that you need a four bit opcode for the instruction format because there are 14 opcodes in total. So four bits will give you 16 opcodes. So there are two unused opcodes that we're not using. And so to do that, we have, class we have to classify the instructions that we have into the different instruction formats. There, the first one there, RRRD, is two source registers and one destination register. And an example of such an instruction would be add subtract. The second one is RRD, which is read memory, which is one source and one destination register. RDIMM is load register, uh, one destination register and uh, immediate value. IMM is just the immediate value. RR is um, two source registers and R is one source register. So if you trial and error a bunch of times, this is, something, this is what you get. Um, the first um, four bits are opcode. I have a flag there, which is a bit awkward to have because I could integrate it into the opcode, but it's a flag for now. And then you sh it, it's that sliced into uh, the destination register, the first source register, RA, the second source register, RB, and that, in that overlaps with the immediate value down there. Yeah. And uh, there are a bunch of quirks in this ISA in that we only have eight bits for immediate value, which means if you want to load it into a 16-bit register, you take three steps. You have to load it twice as eight bits once and eight bits twice, and then you have to OR the two eight bits to get, to get the total 16-bit value. And that's implemented through a load high and load low, which means that you load high means you load the eight bits into the, the higher um, eight bits of the 16-bit register, and load low is load eight bits into the lower 16 bits of the eight-bit register. Yeah, so now coming on to the instruction set decoder, this is what the outputs will look like. You have a clock, an enable, and an instruction that's 16 bits wide. The outputs will be the selection for the A to the, rec to the register file, selection to the B of the register file, selection to the D of the register file, the ALU opcode, which goes to the ALU, which determines what logic operations it does, the immediate value, which is um, sliced out from there as well, and the, w and the right enable, which goes back to the register file to, s to set the right enable for the register file. OK, we'll skip this. Um, test bench process is just um, to set an instruction to the instruction set bus and see if the instruction is correctly decoded. And um, in this one, it is. Yeah. Uh, this is a preview. I'm going to do a part two on this. And I'm building a C assembler to, um, to um, assemble um, assembly stuff into my custom instruction set. Yes. OK, moving on to the ALU, which is the, the most sort of like the brain of, of the entire processor. And it takes in the opcode. The outputs from the two register files, which is data A and data B, the immediate value, the enable bit, the clock, and the outputs will be the data output after it does the arithmetic, um, it does the logic for that, and then the branch, which is actually used for the jump instruction. And when the branch goes high, um, actually, that's only a one bit value, but yeah, that, that, that's not 15 to 0, it's only one bit. When the branch goes high, um, it does a jump operation in the program counter, which we will talk about later. OK, now we have the basic parts down. We have the ALU. The, reg the register file and the instruction set decoder. We can put them together in this way. So the instruction set decoder connects to the register file, connects to the ALU, and there's a few loops there, but I didn't draw it out. And this is what the test bench code looks like. I just put three instructions in. Uh, load register R20XFF, load register R10X01, and I'm doing a subtract of R2 and, um, it's pump subtract of R2 and R1 and putting them into R3. And the output there is, if you can look all the way here, it says 00FE, which means it works. <laughs> so there's a problem there. So if you notice in the test bench, we have a 30 second um, delay between setting of, of, of adjacent bit um, stuff, even though like that has to be hard coded. Because if you set it to one clock cycle, which in this case is 10, um, you, you, you realize that things don't happen in order because for the ALU to do its job, it needs to get the output from the register file. And for the register file to do its job, it needs to get the output from the instruction set decoder. But each component here takes one clock cycle for it to set the output values correctly. So what you need to do is you actually need to wait for each of them to give the correct output before you enable the next one to use the outputs from the previous one. And that's where we come to pipelining. And so this is what basically happens. You, you get completely wrong values. It, you, up there it says FF01, which is definitely not the correct output value. And that's because everything is haywire there. OK, so uh, pipelining comes from the control unit. And basically, um, it just uses enable assertion on all the enable prints I described in the previous modules. And it's uh, essentially a state machine. It uses a six-bit internal register and sets the enable for the fetch cycle, the decode cycle, the register read, 
the ALU, the register write, and the memory. So that's basically the, the, in the, the order in which the pipeline proceeds. Yeah. It fetches, it decodes, the register reads, uh, the register sets its output values, the ALU gets those output values and sets the output for the register to write into in the next one, and then it gets fetches, it fetches or writes to memory. Yep. So um, this just a state machine. The second integrated test um, uses this pipeline in, and um, it's a bit more complicated now, so it loads high into R1, Xerox, ED, it ORs, uh, and it also, uh, at the top, it loads um, Xerox FE into R0. It does a logical OR of R2 and R1, puts them into R, um, R0, and then it loads Xerox 01 into R3, it loads Xerox 02 into R4, it adds them together, and then it does OR overall. And at the end, you get 00 FF again, and it's the correct output. <laughs> So now we have most parts of the thing working. It's, it's a pipeline, by the way. You can see the pipeline here. Decode, um, register read, ALU, register write. Register write has two high bits because it has to enable both the register enable line and the register write enable line. That's why there are two output bits there. So um, for the program counter, um, what it does is um, it, it, it sets the instruct. It, its its job is to fetch the correct instructions from memory. So it takes in a clock. Um, it takes in any program counter value you want to set it to in case you want to jump to a specific program count. It takes in an opcode, which determines whether it stays at the current program count value. It increments by one. It resets and goes back to zero, or it sets the output program count to the program count that you inputted. And it connects to a fake, the fake RAM that I implemented. And the fake RAM is 16-bit addressable, which is why the program counter right now is the, the bus is 16 bits wide. Uh, now, uh, this is basically the state machine. Not really a state machine. It's, it's basically the, the, the decoder that, that, that controls the uh, opcodes to the, to the outputs. The third integrated test implements everything together. It puts, it puts the the, 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 the program counter, the pipelining control unit, and the ALU, the register, read, register, write, and um, the instruction decoder all in the same test bench. And then this is what's written to memory of the fake RAM. The first is to load register to the low position 0, 1, 0, XFP. So this is essentially the same as the last one, except for the last part, what we do is um, we add R3, R4, and put that into R3, back into where it took R3 form, and then we jump back to that instruction. So that basically does an increment cycle there. So it should, it should increment from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, it starts from 0 and goes all the way up to whatever. And so if you observe the cyan colored um, thing at the top, you'll see that it increments. Um, I, it's, I think it's a very low frame rate, but it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yeah, and on and on. And uh, you notice the pipeline got more complicated as well because we added in the fetch and the, and the memory stuff in this stage of the pipeline. And the fetch is basically doing the enable for the program counter. Yeah. OK, so um, wrapping up the summary, um, I'm actually going to have a part two on this. So this is all purely in simulation. We haven't, I haven't synthesized actual logic to go on the FPGA yet. So what I'll be doing is um, you, have to, you have to make sure that it's synthesized properly. You flash on the FPGA. And there are a few improvements that you can do. First, you want to clean up the instruction set architecture, fix the quirks that are there, and finish up the C assembler. And also, um, there is, um, you can actually add memory mapped I.O. to this. So if you map certain amounts of certain parts of RAM to a LED or something on the, on the FPGA, you can get it to toggle on and off by setting the memory value of that particular memory address in RAM. And if you want to look at the GitHub page, it's there. Um, I'll be uploading the slides later on, so you can take a look at it. The FPU assembler is the one that has the full detailed instruction set architecture. And I think that's it. Yes. Thank you. Well, we still actually have uh, five time. minutes more. Anyone have questions? Yes. Do you think you can explain about how you came out with the ISA? Like, what are the minimum instructions that you decided to include? And why you included those instructions? OK, so the ISA. Um, Okay, deciding on, on the minimal uh, amount of instructions they need is, is basically, it's, it's going to be the really bare minimum. So if I actually, I can actually, but I don't have internet. But if I pull up the basic instruction set, it's 
add, subtract. Th those are the basic arithmetic operations that you need. There's no multiply, there's no divide because those require more complicated stuff. So it's just add, subtract. Uh, and both add, add and subtract need signed and unsigned variants. So that's four right there. And of course, oh, I forgot to mention that when I did uh, the add, subtract for the signed and unsigned, instead of putting that inside the opcode as separate opcodes, I used the flag bits instead. So like for example, add, signed, and add, unsigned are the exact same uh, opcodes, but the flag bit will be zero or one. Okay, coming back. So those are, that, that's the basic. And then you need uh, all your logical operators. So that's OR and XOR. And then on top of that, you need load register, which is to load any immediate value into the register because you do that pretty frequently also. Uh, on top of load register, you need memory fetching instructions. So you need write to memory and read to memory. And then after that, um, you'll need your jump instructions, your jump on conditional. So if you want to do a conditional jump, you need a conditional jump instruction there as well. And also a normal jump to immediate value and normal jump to a register because as I said, um, I only have an 8-bit immediate value, so I can't jump to a memory address that is more than 8 bits wide. So the way I solve that is by having, um, by writing to a register first and forming my 16-bit value and then jumping to it. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's the basics that you need. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So you have no support of a stack. Uh, no, not yet. I'm, I'm planning to get there eventually. Right. <laughs> is this a one human or a hardware machine? Hmm? Is this a one human or a hard Oh, 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 I think, I think it, 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 it <laughs> I think it'll be more of a Harvard architecture. Yeah, yeah, at the end of the day. What's the total uh, um, count, line of code count? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> I did not count the code. Uh, but, but if you go to the GitHub, you can probably see it. I'm pretty sure, yeah. But it's not very long, I think. I think each module is within a hundred lines, hundred and something lines. And then, I mean, Verilog, Verilog is extremely compact compared to VHDL. VHDL is, is based on ADA and it's so not, not C, basically. I, I, I prefer Verilog simply because that what takes you to the right hundred lines in VHDL takes you like 20 lines in Verilog, yeah. Do you have to, so how complex would be the addition part? Is that all handled by Verilog itself? Or hmm? For? The, the addition. Oh, the addition, yeah, is handled by Verilog. So both signed and unsigned addition. Signed requires you to just add a dollar sign, signed, and then you put your variable inside, and it handles the addition stuff for you. It's just a plus operator. As, and when you model it in behavioral, um, yeah. The ALU itself, is it a 16-bit ALU or just a 8-bit ALU? It's a 16-bit ALU, yeah, if you look at it. Yeah, it takes in 16-bit values, outputs a 16-bit value. and um, Actually, I, um, when it outputs, it's only a 16-bit value here, but internally it has a 17-bit register so that we can account for overflow and um, stuff like that. And so eventually I'll be able to add an overflow bit to this so that um, you can see if it overflows. Very cool. Any other questions? Yeah, will we have an Arduino version of this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's slowly maybe, but you know, it's... it's Yes, it takes time to build up everything to, to get to that point, yeah. It becomes more and more complex as, it, as the instruction set grows and probably 16-bit instruction set is very, very limited. Like you already see it, like the ISA is packed to the max opcode size already, yeah. Other questions? Yeah? Okay. All right, then with that, thank you so much, Dr. I guess if you've seen him around, you already know.